Welcome to another edition of 805 Sports Talk. We are back. The whole team is here, and we're uh, ready to bring you another uh, action-packed episode. Uh, <laughs> starting off, we'll talk about the Balderas brothers. Um, you know, they're well-known in the area. Uh, Carlos made his pro debut in April, but uh, on Sunday in Bakersfield, both Jose and Carlos Balderas will be fighting. They are on the Victor Ortiz Saul um, Corral undercard. Uh, it's supposed to be a big bout. I uh, expect a lot of people from the Central Coast to travel over there to Bakersfield and see Carlos and Jose, you know, have some professional bouts. Um, Carlos is trying to move to 2-0. and He's fighting Mexico's Adair Fallardo. Um, you know, they're not really too concerned about their opponents. Carlos and Jose both talk about just preparing, focusing on what they need to do to be successful. That's what they're focused on. They're not really too concerned about what their opponents bring to the table. Jose, who's making his pro debut in the Bantamweight division, he's fighting Don Jose, a guy from Stockton. Um, you know, they, they're both very confident going into these fights. Um, Jose's confident. He, ha he hasn't had a pro fight, but they both have a lot of amateur experience. So I'm excited going down to Bakersfield to see that fight, um, see how Carlos does. He's trying to move to 2-0. And he has a very uh, tight schedule, packed schedule coming up. He's fighting Sunday, and then on October 7th, he expects to fight at Staples Center on the um, undercard of the Leo Santa Cruz Abner Mars rematch in Los Angeles. So it's a big schedule packed for uh, Carlos coming up. They trained on Monday at their gym in Santa Maria, I had some media access there. Um, a lot of media was excited to see how Carlos does and Jose. So if you're a fight fan on the Central Coast, you can watch that on Fox Sports 1 or, you know, make a little drive down to Bakersfield. It's at the Robin Bank Arena over there in downtown Bakersfield. See how they do. I'll be there covering it live. So you can uh, follow me on Twitter, um, check our website throughout the evening, see how both of them do. Um, I'm very excited to see how they do. Um, you know, talking to these guys, though, um, I could see the, the stardom kind of brewing in them. Carlos is very well-spoken. Jose as well. They both have that kind of... Um, you know, twinkle in the eyes where they have some charisma, that star power. So once they take care of everything in the ring, I could really see them start blossoming, especially Carlos with what he did at the Olympics. So these are two well-spoken, very character-driven guys. And, you know, once they start taking care of business in the ring, which they've already done, and what they do it on the professional side, I expect their star to keep rising. So if you're a fight fan, be sure to check them out on Sunday. It'll be on FS1. Carlos's bout will be televised live. And then the Victor Ortiz is the main event. So uh, keep an eye out for that Sunday. I think the broadcast starts around 4. Jose will fight earlier, and then Carlos will be fighting right around that time. So be sure to check out FS1, all you fight fans. I know there's a lot of boxing fans in Santa Maria and the Central Coast as a whole. So um, big news over there in Bakersfield. Uh, coming back over here to the Central Coast, we have a pair of youth baseball teams. We've been following them all summer, and they're still going strong. Uh, Lorenzo, you'll start us with Lompoc. Um, they're playing over there in Tahoe. Can you kind of give us an update on what's going on with them? Well, they did run into a roadblock, a major roadblock yesterday from Hawaii in the Oahu area. I mean, just as Tommy Silva, the manager, described it, no matter what they threw at this team, they were ready. They were already just banging, banging on the baseball right away. And interesting enough, the, um, the outfield lights actually went out momentarily for 30 minutes. And... When after that happened, Lompoc actually just started to stage a little bit of a comeback, almost similar to Super Bowl 47, <laughs> so to speak. But, you know, Tommy Silva was really impressed with the way that team played. And there's no doubt in my mind that Hawaii is pretty much that hurdle that Lompoc has to clear now. Lompoc's still not out of it. In fact, they are going to play a game today at 4 p.m. in the consolation bracket against a team from southern Utah, the Milford area. But... The situation for Lompoc now is that they not only have to win out, but they have to win at least six games to claim this championship. Wow. So, I mean, the odds are against Lompoc, but as I spoke with Silva late last night, his his guys don't seem too faced. His guys seem still very upbeat, even despite going against this this huge encounter with Hawaii. But, you know, his guys, they're not ready to uh, end their Tahoe trip just yet. Yeah, so follow Lorenzo on Twitter and check out our website later Wednesday and Thursday, Santa Maria Times, for all that action. Uh, moving over to you, Elliot. You've been following very closely the Orchid team. Uh, how are they doing? What's it, what's it looking like for them? Uh, they're doing great, actually. Uh, uh, like the Lompoc 15-year-olds, uh, Orchid uh, had a, overcome a hurdle in Hawaii, uh, and they did this year. Hawaii was the 13-year-old uh, uh, Babe Ruth uh, uh, Pacific Southwest Regional Champion last year, and they beat 
Orkut last year, and Orkut was looking to get some revenge in the 14-year-old level. And they're, uh, both teams bring back the majority of their players, so these kids know each other. And earlier today, at an 8 a.m. game, Orkut prevailed. They beat Hawaii 2-1, to one, so that's their second straight win. They opened the tournament with an 11 to nothing victory over Bel Mateo, the Northern California champions. You see them there. They were in front of uh, Diamondback Stadium, Chase Field where they were honored before uh, uh, before Monday night's uh, Diamondbacks game. Uh, now, their, their tournament started with a rain out. Uh, Monday, they were rained out. There were torrential rains, thunderstorms, lightning. So they canceled the whole day uh, and pushed everything back and condensed it. So they didn't just push it all back a day. They, they made people double up. So for instance, Surprise Arizona, the host team, they had to play uh, a 10 a.m. game on Tuesday, uh, which they lost, and then they had to play, no, which they won, I'm sorry, then they had to play a 1 o'clock game against Hawaii, which they lost, and then they had to play a uh, 7 p.m. game against Northern California, Bel Mateo, and they lost that. So they ended up playing three games yesterday. It was crazy. But everything is now getting back on track. Uh, so today, uh, Orkut beat Hawaii 2-1. to one. Uh, Caleb DeLay was the starting pitcher in today's game. Uh, Isaiah Navarro started uh, the Tuesday game, and he gave up just one hit in four innings. Uh, and then Nate Cantor came out and relieved him and uh, had a perfect fifth. And the game was called after uh, five innings because of the run rule. And uh, Isaiah could have had a no-hitter, but there was an infield slow roller. Uh, then the runner just beat it out to first. The manager, James Steeles, told me it was a bang-bang play. Uh, and it was called, the guy was called safe, and that was the difference between a one-hitter and a no-hitter. Uh, but everybody contributed. They, they hit. Uh, Orkut in that first game had one strikeout. That's it. Everybody made contact. They made... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Northern California Bel Mateo team field the ball and then they were aggressive on the base paths. They took every advantage they could. Tuesday, uh, today was a, a, a much different game because it was two to one. It was a pitcher's duel. Dulé was on the mound and he had a great game. We'll have all the details of that in uh, uh, tomorrow's San Maria Times. It'll be online tonight and right now they're taking a break getting back to the air conditioning because <laughs> the temperatures have been a hundred degrees and coming from here playing baseball in a hundred degree weather is pretty tough for these kids. So now they're going to face Torrance, the Southern California champion. Uh, Torrance beat uh, the Yuma Arizona team also at 8 a.m. today. That was a one run game eight to seven. So now their road is different than Lompoc's. Lompoc's got to win a lot of games coming out of the elimination bracket. Orchid, if they could beat Torrance and beat whoever comes out of the el elimination bracket, they could go 4-0 and and be the champion. So they would only have to play four games. And that's one of the things that James Steeles is impressed on his players. Uh, you know, we win these games. We play fewer games. We're out in the heat less. Uh, so we've got to concentrate on playing error-free baseball, pitching. You've got to throw strikes, got to keep them off balance, and the defense has to be there. You've got to be anticipating, and they position the players great, and also uh, be aggressive at the plate. Uh, attack early in the count. You know that the other guy's going to come at you with his best stuff on the first pitch. Looking for it. Whatever his best stuff is, they know it by now. Look for it and attack it, and so far they've been successful. So they play again tomorrow, Torrance, 8 a.m. All right. Uh, we've also kind of learning that this is the year that a lot of schools or other places announce their Hall of Fame's inductions. You know, Lorenzo, you've been following Cabrillo and, and Lompoc usually does the Hall of Fame stuff over the summer, but we got a little treat on Friday. We got an email from the uh, legendary Eric Burdick at Cal Poly, and he's announcing the Cal Poly uh, Hall of Fame class. And uh, browsing through that email, we saw that one of the inductees is Christina Santiago, a star Rigetti basketball player, Rigetti grad, starred at Cal Poly. Uh, conference MVP and uh, Kenny you got a chance to, to catch up with Christina and get her thoughts on uh, you know being an inductee to the Cal Poly Hall of Fame how did she feel about it and uh, what's going on with her well she said in so many words that she teared up when she heard the announcement that she was going to be inducted that was it was very emotional for her she said she has had a lot of honors but including her number 12 jersey being retired at Cal Poly but this was, the, this was the best one. 
I was a bit startled when she said she's she's bowling retirement from basketball. But um, as she spoke, I could see why she's been playing in the European League for five years. She would have played this year. She said she signed a very good contract with a Bulgarian team, but um, Bulgaria stopped registering foreign players for the time being. They will not register any until 2020. So she is at home in Orkut. Um, as she talked, I could see why she is more retirement. When you think about it, she's she doesn't live full time in Europe. She's played for five different teams in Europe, and she comes home over the summer. So she as she she stays over there for nine months, so then travels back here for three months um, to kind of reset her life and so forth. Then she goes back over there. Um, even with the limited flying I've done myself, um, airplane travel has lost its appeal for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was very <laughs> excited when I was a youngster flying for the first time, but since then I, I don't really have any fun on planes, especially with the um, added hassle of pre-check-in and so forth. So I can't imagine what pro players and college players go through with all that travel and so forth. But um, her thoughts have turned to coaching. She said the players have, have really taken to her. She's really taken to the players. Um, seems like she she would be a fine fit for a coach. Um, she's not aloof at all. She's very friendly. And of course, um, being such a good player and so forth, she's very knowledgeable about the game. So she's, I think she's very much looking forward to um, probably going into a coaching career. That is where she's at now. She will be inducted in September. Just not sure of the date yet. I'm sure as, as the date comes closer, Cal Poly will send a specific date when she will be inducted. Yeah, so congratulations to uh, T Santiago's as, as they call her. Um, probably maybe the most successful women's basketball player the area has produced uh, with what she did at Cal Poly and, and playing overseas professionally. It's not easy to do, but she, she grinded through that over five seasons. So I'm sure she'll be successful in whatever she does next. We, we see that Rigetti can produce great coaches. Desiree Dominguez, who is a close friend of hers, uh, has, has done a great job at Rigetti. So I wouldn't be surprised. The former she, Desiree Dominguez. Yeah. <laughs> She's now yeah. Desiree yeah. Hitch. Desiree yeah. Hitch. Um, yeah, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Christina Santiago also turns into a suc successful coach as well. So congratulations to her, and we'll be sure to bring you the update on that Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame induction at Cal Poly. Uh, moving on to water polo. This is almost a weird time for water polo over the summer, but a lot of youth water polo, and we have one of our teams, One Way Water Polo, first time at the Junior Olympics, and they have shown out over there in Irvine. I think they won their first four or five games, mm -hmm. then a third place finish on Tuesday. Um, Elliot, you were following them closely. Uh, were they happy with their third place finish? Do you think they could have done a little bit better? How, how did they feel about that? No, they were really happy with it. They had a great run. They went 6-1 and one overall. They uh, won their first five games, got into the semifinals against a really tough San Clemente team. Uh, they lost that game 13-10, to 10, but they were in it all the way. Uh, there, so there's not, no reason to hang their heads. And then they came back, and now here's where the game really could have been tough. They had to play a third place game against Santa Monica Westside, a team they'd actually beaten earlier. Uh, it's tough to beat a team twice because they know who you are, they know now after playing you who your best players are, but it goes both ways. So they also knew Westside's best players, who they had to shut down. But after, and it, they play them back to back too, it's not like they had a day off to you know gather their thoughts. So after losing 13 to 10 to San Clemente, they had to come right back in the pool and a rematch against Sa uh, Santa Monica Westside, and they won that one, 11-8 for a third place finish. Uh, and uh, their their coach uh, Whitfield said to me that uh, Miles Whitfield uh, said that, um, uh, or is it Mike Whitfield? Miles. Mike Whitfield said to me that uh, they uh, uh, they could have hung their heads, uh, but it, they they showed their backbone, they showed they wanted it more, they were exhausted by the end of that game, uh, and they, they just dug deep, and they came out with the win. Uh, Lucas Anderson had seven goals in that game. Levi Pick was a standout on defense, and his, uh, he's the young man who had to miss some practices so he could go to New York with his older brother, Noah Pick, for that NBA b basketball, uh, three th uh, point, uh, basketball th throwing championship. Uh, Zach Whitfield uh, had five goals in the first ga game, and Logan Todd had uh, seven steals. 
but it was a total team effort. They were really happy. Charlie Bell was there as an assistant coach, and he's the guy that more or less runs that one-way water polo. And th they were thrilled. To, it was their first ever appearance. Uh, here's what they kept telling these kids and what everybody kept in mind. They come from Santa Maria, and they're very proud of that. They were playing teams that uh, come from huge cities with lots of kids that are in these programs, so they're elite. These programs have money behind them. They travel all around the country, and they beat them. They beat them six times. They lost to a powerful San Clemente team in, in the semifinals, but they beat everybody else, including uh, 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 a third-place game where they <coughs> excuse me, could have hung their heads, but they, were, they, they played it right to the last minute, came home with third place, first ever appearance in the water polo junior Olympics. So they came home proud, and everybody was really happy with the outcome. They would have liked to win one more game, but for your first time against those big programs, the big cities, uh, and the big money teams, uh, they're really thrilled that they could show everybody what the kids on the Central Coast are made of. Yeah, congratulations to them. Talking to them before the tournament, they had no idea what to expect out there. For, so for them to win as many games as they did and, and finish third at the Junior Olympics is a great achievement. Um, you know, who knows what will happen next. I'm sure that will kind of give them a boost and expand the, the program over there. Charlie Bell does a great job for, for one way and water polo as a whole in, in the Santa Maria Valley and, and throughout the Central Coast. So congratulations to them. Uh, that's all we got for this week. Uh, you know, it's getting closer and closer to the football season. So Keep tuning into the show. We're going to start breaking it, breaking down the football season uh, more and more as the season draws near. We got a, a lot of football coverage planned for you guys. So thank you guys for tuning in this week. And uh, be sure to tune in over the next couple weeks as uh, we get deeper and deeper into uh, football that's coming up here.